Thank you for joining Antelope Christian Center. We believe in the power of worship and the power of foundation of faith upon God's Word. Our vision and our ministry is built upon loving God and loving others. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. He is risen. A study of the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ called the Passion Week. The very last few days on earth in a mortal body, the Lord Jesus Christ. The history is recorded both of the ministry of Christ on earth and the church in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the book of Acts. Of course, the Gospels are all about Jesus. Let me share with you as we begin our study this month, he is risen. With a perspective of the Gospels that you may never have considered. The book of Matthew, the book of Matthew contains only 28 chapters. Eight of those chapters are focused on the Passion Week. That is about one-third of the book of Matthew deals exclusively with the last week in the life of Christ. Now, I say the last week in the life of Christ. You recall in the creation narrative that God rested on the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. Later, you remember in the book of Exodus chapter 20, how Moses brought down from the mount of the Lord the Ten Commandments. You remember the, um, the, the, the commandment to remember to keep the Sabbath holy. And I hope you do, always. But the Jewish week ended with the Sabbath, which brings to the question, why do we come to church on Sunday and not Saturday? Because Saturday is the Sabbath. Well, the answer is simply, for the last 2,000 years, since the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christians have worshipped on Sunday. Now, look at this week with me. The Sabbath is Saturday. Palm Sunday did not happen on the Sabbath, which is Saturday. It started with Jesus coming into the, into the city of Jerusalem, the journey to the cross on Sunday. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, five days. Jesus said, enter into the city of Jerusalem. He worshiped at the temple. And then on Thursday night, he celebrated the Passover meal in the upper room with the apostles. You remember that story? Judas, who would betray Christ. That night when he was in the garden after they had dinner, Falsely accused, Jesus is arrested. Not on Monday night or Wednesday night or Sunday or Saturday. It all happened on Thursday night. It was a very, very long night for Jesus. And early the next morning, falsely accused, he would be sentenced to death upon the cross. We call it Good Friday, Christ was crucified. Let's review again this final week called the Passion Week. It all starts on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then on Friday, Christ is crucified and placed in the tomb for three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Guess why Christians worship on Sunday? It's because that's the day 
that Jesus rose from the dead. Can somebody say amen? We serve a risen Savior. And this all begins, the journey to the cross, on Palm Sunday. The book of Matthew, one-third of the story, is from Sunday to Sunday, the resurrection of the Lord. In the book of Luke, 25% of the 24 chapters are all about the final week in the life of Christ. In the Gospel of Mark, you may never have considered this. But it's the reason why the journey to the cross is so important. This book, Mark, that only has 16 chapters, the shortest of the four Gospels, 40% of the content is the Passion Week of Jesus. And the Gospel of John has been translated into thousands of languages around the world. You would be hard-pressed to identify a nation, a country, a language that does not have the Gospel of John translated in their native language language, whether you're in Latin America, Africa, Russia, China, India, all the different dialects. The Gospel of John is the standard and the introduction of the Word of God in every language available to us. And guess what? The Gospel of John that has 21 chapters. What is it about? Signs, wonders, miracles, the precious teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, all of them contain these stories and the teachings and the miracles. Jesus walking on water, the healing of the blind man. Thank you, Jesus. The raising of the dead. The teaching of the parables. They're in the four Gospels. But did you know the number one book translated around the world with 21 chapters, 50% of the book is about the Passion Week of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is the journey of the, to the cross important? It is the majority of the content recorded under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. It is the gospel that Jesus freely gave. He sacrificed his life. It is important because this man, mortal man, who is the son of God that was birthed in the story of the birth of Christ, conceived by the Holy Spirit, was without sin. He walked the earth just like you. He experienced the same migraine, the same headache. If he was touched, he was bruised. If he was poked, he would blade. If he was executed, he would die. Jesus, the Son of Man, who gave his life freely, unlike you or me, was without sin. He died on the cross, sacrificed without sin. The journey to the cross begins in, in the Gospel of John. It's found in chapter 12. 
with your Bibles open to John chapter 12. Look with me in verse number 12. The next day, the news that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem swept through the city. Everybody was talking about it. Everybody was talking about it. Why were there so many people in Jerusalem when Christ was crucified? Why were they there on Palm Sunday? It was Passover. Everyone gathered throughout the entire region and country of Israel to be in Jerusalem at the temple during Passover. Oh, but there's much more to this story than Passover itself, especially in the Gospel of John. You see, the chapter before Jesus is recorded to be riding on the young donkey going into the city and the palm branches are waving and people are singing, before that happens, maybe just a few days or a, a week or two before, is John chapter 11. John chapter 11 reveals to us why people ran out of the city to see Jesus arrive. Oh, they remembered his teaching with power and authority. They remembered the signs, wonders, and miracles, how Jesus walked on water, how he healed the blind and raised the dead. They remembered all of them. They all remember the story of the feeding of the 5,000, but that's not the reason why on that Palm Sunday they went running. The rest of the story is when Jesus came to town, he brought the parade with him. Yes, there were the apostles. Even Judas was a part of that parade. There Jesus is sitting upon the young call donkey, and, and the apostles were around. Followers and disciples were around, but buried in that crowd was one that everybody wanted to see. They couldn't believe what they had heard. His two sisters were Mary and Martha. In the prior chapter, they were upset with Jesus and confronted him and said, Jesus, where were you? Where were you? Our brother was sick. We sent you an email. We sent you a text message. We called you on our cell phones. We, we, whatever mode of communication, was it a pigeon or a turkey, a bald eagle? Or I don't know how they communicated, but there's no question they sent word to Jesus that their beloved brother was sick unto dying and that he needed to get there right now or Lazarus was dying. He didn't come. Lazarus died. And everybody knew that Lazarus had died. He was in the tomb by the time Jesus arrived for, may I say it, may I say it, stinking days. His body was rotting in the tomb. They protested when Jesus wanted to go to the cemetery. They did not want Christ there. He insisted when he arrived at the tomb. It's a remarkable story. He ordered that the stone be rolled away. It's so remarkable because by the end of this week, it's going to take an angel to roll away his stone. By the end of the week, he's the one lifeless inside a tomb. But in this story, it was Lazarus that was in the tomb and Jesus was outside the tomb. He said, roll that stone away. They did, reluctantly and under great protest. Picture this. The stench coming out of the tomb the decaying body inside properly wrapped for burial. Never to see daylight, but now it was. 
Jesus walks up to the tomb, and before he looks up in, he looks up. Let me say it again. Before he looked in and saw death, he looked up and saw the Father. Somebody say amen. amen. Some of you today are looking in before you look up. Some of you today are focused in on the devastation and the difficulty that this world has to offer when you should be looking up before you look in. Jesus looked up first. I don't know what he said, but I know what he said after he looked up. He looked in, and with a shout he said to the dead, Lazarus, come out. This dead man rose, wrapped in clothes of death, called grave clothing. If you will, you have a mummy coming out of a tomb. That would cause some of us to run. The story of the resurrection of Lazarus was fresh on the hearts of many, many people. They heard it. They knew about it. They knew he had died. And now, not only was he alive, but a dead man was walking into the city. And the people ran out in droves. As they ran out, they were giving honor to the Messiah. They were singing to Jesus. The next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the entire city. A crowd of visitors that had gathered to see the dead man walking, raised from the dead, and to see the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Understand, their curiosity was to see Lazarus, but they were not there with palm branches honoring Lazarus. No, they were honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. They took those palm branches, they ran down the road, they met Jesus, and they began to sing, Hosanna, 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 King James, in John chapter 12. Praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hail to the king of Israel. Why were they singing Hosanna? Why were they calling Jesus king? Take your Bibles and slide back to the Old Testament to the book of Psalms chapter 118. I'll get started as you turn Psalms 118. Give thanks to the Lord, King David wrote. The Lord is good. His faithful love endures forever. Verse 5, in my distress, I called out to the Lord and prayed, and the Lord answered me. The Lord said to me, have no fear. What can people do to you? The Lord is for you. The Lord will help you. I will look in triumph at all of those who despise me, those who hurt me with their words, those who hurt me with their attack, those who hate me, King David wrote. Remember, his son was Solomon, excuse me, Absalom, where he turned his back on his father. Yes, the Lord is with me. The Lord will help me. I will look to triumph against those who hate me family, or friend. It is so much better to take refuge in the Lord than depend on people to save you. It won't happen. Though hostile nations surround me, 
I am destroyed. I will destroy each of the enemy, not by my not, not by my might nor by my power, but by the authority of the Lord. Somebody say amen. Yes, they surround you. Yes, they attack you. But you're going to be delivered. You will not be destroyed. And you will be saved by the authority of the Lord. Say the word authority. You will be delivered not by your might, nor by your power, but by your authority in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your enemy, they're going to swarm around you like bumblebees. They will blaze against you like a crackling fire ready to destroy you. But you will destroy your enemy by the authority of the Lord himself. Verse 14. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my song. The Lord has given me victory. Thank you, Jesus. You're here today, and you're going through the valley, and you are so discouraged, and you're so frustrated, and it just seems like things are unraveling. God has a message in his word for you today. If you memorized one passage of scripture, you, this week, will have victory. If you memorize chapter 118, verse number 14, here's what it says. The Lord is your strength. The Lord will put a song in your heart in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the wind, in the middle of the attack. God will put a song in your spirit. And the Lord will give you victory. Open for me the gates where the righteous enter into the fold. John chapter 10, when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, he said, I am the gate. Open for me the gate where the righteous are going to enter in, and I will go in and I will thank the Lord. These gates lead, these gates lead to the very presence of Almighty God, and the godly enter in. I thank you for answering my prayer. I thank you for giving me victory for the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. You put tile in your living room. You pulled up something in the kitchen and laid tile. You did it yourself. You remodeled your bathroom and you put tile on the floor and you discovered something. Though there are thousands and thousands of tiles that have to be laid in that particular job of improvement in your home, you discover the single most important tile is the first tile you laid down. Because if that tile is not perfect, if it is not properly placed, Every other tile that you put in will be off just a little bit. And when you come to the end, none of it will work. Why? Because it's that cornerstone. Who is the one with perfection? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot build your life or your house upon a denominational leader, some preacher, some author, somebody with great personality and charisma, somebody that wrote a Christian song, and you just say, you have all of their albums. And then one day, they morally failed, and you built your life on a Christian artist as a cornerstone. I rebuke you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is one cornerstone, and he is the Lamb of God. He is without sin. He will not be in a scandal. He will not be found on the headlines. He will not lie. He will not morally fail. When he died on the cross, he was the only perfect man that ever lived on planet Earth. 
He is the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is wonderful. And that's the reason why verse 24 follows. This is the day the Lord has made. This is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Tell your face to smile. Did you know every time you smile, a wrinkle goes away? You didn't know that, did you? It's true. I'm not making it up. Peter Pan will tell you that Tinkerbell will die unless you believe. Santa Claus will tell you unless you believe. I saw the movie. The reindeer can't fly. Let me tell you. Smile. The wrinkles will go away. You have problems at home? You're so unhappy. I love it when people are unhappy. They come to me like a magnet. A magnet. Of, Pastor, I'm so unhappy. Let me tell you about my kids. Let me tell you about the spouse. Let me tell you about the government. Okay, we all agree. We're unhappy. We're all in agreement. So what are you going to do? You're unhappy. You're unhappy. And you're going to make everybody around you unhappy. Will you moan and groan and run around moaning and groaning? And then you say, well, I wonder why I don't have any friends. I wonder why I feel like I just, there's a circle around me and there's a shield that people won't come in. They don't want to talk with me. Friend, somebody's got to tell you. They're running from you. You tell your face to smile. You may not feel like smiling. Do it anyway. Somebody say amen. The Bible says, this is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for joining Antelope Christian Center. We believe in the power of worship and the power of foundation of faith upon God's Word. Our vision and our ministry is built upon loving God and loving others.